good morning everyone and welcome to speak up africa this is a digital platform that seeks to inform engage and empower the community on civic duties and civic matters and today we'll be discussing the unemployment insurance fund which was a bill proposed back in 2022 last year late last year and it was more so of unveiling kenya's unemployment solution so the bill itself, uh, it emerges as a crucial step forward so as to tackle the unemployment issues that are arising in Kenya, and it's meant to combat unemployment issues. So this bill, it introduces the foundation of the Unemployment Insurance Authority, which is basically a board, a board or a body that is meant to tackle the issues of unemployment. And this entity will be tasked um, with ensuring that eligible employers or employees receive unemployment benefits and laying down a comprehensive strategy to mitigate the social economic repercussions of the joblessness. So basically it's trying to offer a way out or rather a way in for people who have lost their jobs or are not employed. And together, who is going to be discussing these matters with me is my fellow Nora Kimani. I would love for him to introduce himself. Welcome Kimani. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kimani Janga. I'm a final year law student at Kenyatta University. Um, I also serve as the president of the All Kenyan Mutukut Competition. It's an organization that brings together all law schools within the country to debate and speak about the contemporary issues that are happening in the country, including some of the issues we will be discussing today. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me and I look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimani, for accepting our offer. And so I would just like to just dive deep into the entire discussion. And I think my first question, basically we're here discussing about the unemployment insurance bill or an employment insurance fund, which is basically uh, meant to sort out the unemployment issues within Kenya. And my first question to you, Kimani, would be, what do you think motivated the introduction of the, introduction of the unemployment insurance fund? All right. Um, I think in my view, what prompted the introduction of all of this is the escalating uh, unemployment situation that we've had in the country, especially since COVID-19 struck. Co when COVID came um, in late 2019 and for the better part of 2020, we saw a lot of people losing their jobs uh, because companies could no longer afford to pay them. Most of them were declared redundant and unemployment was on the rocket high since COVID-19. And even though we could say things have gone back to normal, a lot of people have never gone back to unemployment and unemployment has continued to rise, especially from young people. Therefore, uh, what prompted the introduction of this bill is the escalating unemployment situation, especially since COVID-19 came, in order to cushion employers or employees when they eventually lose their jobs and they have nowhere to go to. I think this fund um, or the provisions of this bill will enable people to be cushioned and to provide to provide them some sort of a soft landing in the unlikely event that they lose em em employment. So I think COVID and the growing unemployment situation in Kenya is what has gotten us here. And I think that's a good, uh, that's a good step. Okay. Uh, so you think COVID most definitely escalated the situations when it comes to unemployment, but you do stand by the fact that we've already been struggling with an unemployment issue, especially when it comes to the youth. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, we have had a problem as a country with unemployment because, especially from young people, um, it was it's not just COVID that brought unemployment, but it just exposed the underbelly of how deeply entrenched uh, unemployment is, especially from young people. Uh, and I think what prompts this is that a lot of young people are really looked down upon by companies by corporates, uh, most people tend to hire, I think, older people. At times you're told to have a number of years job experience in order to qualify for a job. And as a young person who's just graduated out of campus, you have nowhere to get that and it becomes extremely difficult uh, for you to secure a job. So a lot of young people are struggling with unemployment 
And recently, the deputy president told graduates in JQuart that he can't assure them of jobs and it's out there for them to fend for themselves. That tells you how dire the situation is. Yes, I true. I genuinely believe that. I can personally attest to it. So my second question to you, Kimani, would be, how do you think the rising unemployment issue and employment impact is impacting the Kenyan economy and the society in general? All right. Uh, we are a country, we are a third world, third world country. When a lot of people are unemployed, what that means is that our economy doesn't even grow. Uh, we struggle, people will struggle to buy the basic necessities because they, they don't have money. They don't have the money. So the spending, the people's spending power goes down. And as I, what does that do to our economy? It makes, a, it, it destabilizes the economy because if people are unable to afford even the basic needs, then that means that um, our economy definitely goes down. If we have companies manufacturing stuff, but they have no consumers or people to buy them because people have no money, then they will not be making, there will be no business, they will not be making money, and our economy goes to shambles. Other problem is there is a potential for increased poverty. And what increased poverty does, it affects even the social fabric uh, of the society. When we have a lot of poverty, that's where issues such as crime start increasing. Uh, when we have a lot of unemployment and poverty, people are no longer even able to contribute to political processes like public participation, holding your leaders to, to account, because what people will be concerned with is putting food on the table. Nobody will be concerned on whether they go to vote or they go and do this and that, especially the political processes. And what that means, we'll continue to have bad governance in the, in the country because people no longer care. And as a result, um, as a result of bad governance, the, we go back to where it all started. Bad governance, uh, bad policies, no, no employment for young people. So I think it's a ripple effect. And unemployment has far-reaching, rising unemployment has far-reaching social and economic implications for our country. Yes, I totally agree with you. And on the aspect that you mentioned about um, not having not having like people lack interest when it comes to political issues i think last uh the last election we had i think i think there were very few people who voted like like the way it normally is compared to how it normally is it was very you could clearly see a difference and i can definitely speak for the fact that youths don't vote at all you'll find a couple of people that haven't voted and not interested in voting don't want to vote because they have this um Thing that they say they have something that they say like uh, they've already chosen their leader either people don't want to have anything to do with who comes on board because they just don't see any difference with the person who will be joining the new government so i find that quite interesting uh thank you for that kimani so i will proceed to also ask you can you explain the main goals and the objectives of the un unemployment insurance bill and especially you getting the unemployment insurance fund Absolutely. So the unemployment insurance uh, bill has been introduced to parliament. Of course, we are waiting to, to see how it goes after the debates go all in. But the objective of the, the bill, first of all, has created something we call the unemployment insurance fund, which will, to which will be contributed by both the employer and the employee. And the main objective of the fund is to provide benefits to employees who become unemployed or their respective beneficiaries in order to caution them or to cushion them against harmful social economic uh, effects of unemployment. So the bill, the, so we will have a fund. The, the bill has also proposed uh, creation of an employment insurance authority, which will be a body corporate with a board, a chairperson, and, and an entire staff. Uh, so the functions of the authority will be to administer this fund that will be contributed by both the employee and the employer and to create a legal framework uh, for how these funds are going to be administered. So the main objective is, for example, at the end of the month, I envision a situation where uh, both the employer and the employee contribute uh, a percentage of the um, 
of their income towards this fund. And then uh, in the event that you become unemployment, just like how insurance works, you'll be entitled to this money that you've been contributing. But of course, uh, that raises a lot of questions because we currently have people who are unemployed contributing already too much. There was an introduction of the housing levy. There was there are new taxes that have been imposed, uh, especially payers one for high income earners, which has already taken effect. So I'm not sure if this will sit well with the unemployed people, given that they are already contributing um, a lot and they're already complaining that hey, these contributions are too much burner. So I don't know if we introduce uh, another form of contribution, how it's going to sit with employers, but generally that's the whole objective of the of the fund and the bill, which I find to be noble. It depends with uh, what uh, our salaried friends will think about it. Okay, so now I I would love to ask you know, a personal question. It will be more very like personal to you. Mm -hmm. So. For instance, you're, employed, you're earning well, uh, you're already going through this taxing and levying from the government, like the housing, the insurance, there's this and that, the NHI. If everything has changed since the new government came into place, what would you? What would be your personal feeling or your personal sentiments or, or insights when it comes to this issue? Do you think it's right for, because this bill initially it was proposed in South Africa, a very similar bill was proposed. So it's like we're taking away from that. So what do you think this means to the people who are employed? And if you were employed as well, how would you take it? Is this something you'd be glad to take on? Is this something you'd have like, you know, restrictions on and you'd be like, I don't want this. I'm already paying for enough. Why do I have to pay for someone who's not employed? You understand? So what are your personal sentiments on this? Are you for the bill? Are you not for the bill? We will, we will not take it personal. You know, it's just, I just want to hear your, your mindset on this issue. Um, I think personally, uh, I feel if our, if our employed right now, um, and okay, it means, first of all, you're paying more in HF. You're already paying for a housing levy. Uh, I feel like we have a government that wants to impose so much on people. Um, and it all started with a debate on housing. Uh, just contribute as part of doing goodwill so that we create jobs and build homes for other people or contribute this fund so that we cushion those who are unemployed. I think for me, we I would, it will not sit well with me. I think the government should just allow people to make their own voluntary contributions. If I am interested in pursuing an insurance policy, for example, for when I become unemployed, I am at liberty to do that personally. If other people probably might not be interested in the same because they are already not earning too much and a lot of people really don't care about the future. We just want to get to Friday. So I think the government should just allow people to do it at their own will as opposed to imposing and making it mandatory for people to contribute. In the alternative, what they could do is just create more awareness on the importance of cushioning yourself and creating more awareness uh, and teaching people or even employers telling people, hey, guys, it is important for you to save for the future. And leave it at that. Let the people exercise their right to self-determination. If they want to contribute for their, for their future and insurance policies, depending on how much they earn and what their needs are, that's fine. But some other people will feel hey, I already have too much responsibilities. I'm not earning as much. So please don't just take away uh, this little that I'm earning from me. So I think probably I don't agree with the fact that it's making it mandatory for people to contribute, given that we already have so much contribution. And given the way in this country we have a lot of mismanagement of funds, and I generally have trust issues with how you know government operates, uh, I hope we don't see a scandal and then people's contributions have suddenly vanished. So I think I will have trust issues with it. And I think what should be done is to just create more awareness to people on the importance of saving and allow them to save at their own will as opposed to making it compulsory. Okay. Okay. And I personally agree with that. I think the government, as much as it's taking, I think it should also be able to give 
because as far as we're concerned, the government takes a lot. There's, there's this and then there's that, there's this levy. And then like yesterday, I think the Treasury was asking Kenyans to propose ways in which they could lead to more taxation for the finance bill, you know, of 2024. And honestly, most people are tired. They're feeling exhausted. They're feeling like they're like a dying horse and they're still being kicked when they're down, you know. So I feel like as much as the government is taking, it should give as well. We should be able to see the changes and the consequences of the things that we do. Because so far we're not seeing consequences. Because if you take if you take in as much and then you give in as much, then people, as much as people will complain, they'll also look at it and be like, okay, the government did something good for us. The government, the infrastructure is good. People, the starvation is is low. The the when it comes to you know, even right now the baseline is quite high. You know, the the the, the yeah. price they could they could recommend it and be like, okay, the, at least the maize price, the maize flour price went low. At least the people who are not starving in Trukana, you know, if it's something like that, then we could appreciate the government for what it's doing. But so far, I think we just feel like it's taking, taking, taking to a point where we just can't understand maybe when they propose bills that could eventually help us in the long run because we just don't see it helping us. Most people are just looking at it like, okay, this is probably going to go into someone's pocket. Where am I, you know, why am I, why is my money being taken away for this? I don't support this. So yeah, personally, those are my personal sentiments and I don't advocate for it unless I can see a consequence to a certain action. If there's a, if we're paying for a certain bill or we're not necessarily a bill, if we're paying for a certain um uh, fund or an insurance or something or we're being taxed for something then we should be able to see like okay these are the consequences of this and we appreciate the work that's being done okay so my next question to you kimani would be what potential social economic impacts can be mitigated through the bill's provisions um all right uh while we generally if this bill because in kenya we have we have good laws I think we have some of the most progressive and very good laws that we enact. Every day in day out, we enact very good laws. But the problem is implementation. We have a problem with implementing some of these good laws that we enact in parliament. So, for example, this bill, as noble as it may sound, and if it's implemented to the best of its ability, it could have potential social economic problems. But the social economic implications but the problem is if, if the implementation aspect if it's not done correctly then the social economic benefits i'm going to mention in a few will not be implemented so i begin by putting that caveat laws are as good as their implementation if they remain on paper then the benefits of which they are enacted will not be realized so some of them benefits uh, that come to mind especially you know economic aspect is you know cautioning people it encourages people to it creates an aspect of financial um independence because um people who lose their jobs for example are cautioned or are protected in the event that they don't have to have a very huge landing, they have a soft landing where they can bank on for a few months and continue with their, um, with their work. A another thing is it also provides some form of stability, especially during job transitions. Um, it helps people to cover their expenses while they are actively searching for new em employment um, opportunities so that doesn't make it uh, very difficult for them. Another aspect, it, it helps uh, maintain consumer spending, especially when people receive unemployment benefits, they are more likely to continue spending on essential goods and services that they were spending even when they were unemployed. And obviously what that does when spending, when consumer spending goes up, it stimulates the economy. And obviously when we have a lot of spending, um, demand increases, supply, and as a result, we have more money into the economy, which is a good thing. It also helps reduce some form of pressure uh, on public assistance programs, because uh, what unemployment does is, if you're unemployed, for example, uh, you will put pressure on your relatives, on your friends, and everyone will have to feel like the pinch of your unemployment. So when people are cautioned, uh, it provides them with a direct source of financial support, and this 
you know helps the government even save on social welfare systems so those are the positive things that will come about if this bill is implemented to its full effect otherwise we won't realize the benefits so the problem the catch is in the implementation aspect okay i find that quite interesting i think the way you've explained it is way better than anyone would have and i do i do support you when you say even if it has a lot of benefits that we could take away from this if it's not implemented then it's close to nothing it's like we're basically doing zero work so i will go ahead and preferably ask you our last question which is what legal capacities does the authority have and how will the and how will it provide guidance on an employment insurance strategies um, that's a very interesting question so the bill proposes to have the insurance authority as a body corporate capable of suing and being sued and obviously if the bill comes to pass the authority will have legal standing it will be a whole authority with funding from government on how it runs its affairs with staff who are going to be employed so that means it will have like um it will be an um a legal entity a legal entity uh if that come if that happens um probably one of the functions of the authority as proposing the bill is to advise the government on the strategies that can be put in place and to come up with policy frameworks that can guide the administration of this fund so obviously the proposals that are going to come from this authority and they can be somehow enacted into into law through parliament and of course through lobbying the authority can also come up with something we call subsidiary legislation um subsidiary legislation are like schedules to an act so once we have subsidiary legislation it's like policy document we could guide on how it's going to work how this fund is going to be administered what ways we can make sure that people benefit from the fund what are the timelines for claiming for this money uh what are the deadlines for submissions of this fund once they come up with such a framework which will have the legal status of law then it will probably help the government uh, implement better and advise the cabinet secretary on policies that should be put in place in order to caution workers and in a way it could also incentivize um, employment because you know once people know that even if i lose my job i have somewhere i can bank on i think people are going to be more motivated to seek employment which i don't know where they're going to find it but it could act as an incentive so overall um the legal framework uh, will be governed by if the bill comes in, comes into law and then we can if we have subsidiary legislation then that could help advance the strategies that um, the organization or the authority is going to put in place. It will be the same like NEMA. There are so many authorities in this country created by law. Just like we have NEMA, just we have the uh, employment authority, National Employment Authority. So all of this, their main objective is to come up with policies and advise the government on best practices to ensure that people's needs are protected and respected. Okay. Um, so personally, I have like the ultimate question. I feel like you've broken everything down perfectly. And I think anyone who's going to hear this discussion afterwards will have a proper understanding of what the what the bill stands for. Because there was a lot of reaction, especially on the internet from Kenyans when it comes to this particular bill. Because everyone was like, oh my gosh, another bill and, and more taxation. But I feel like the way you've broken it down helps people understand what they're in for and what it is all about. So I would um, just love to end it by asking you, how do you think this bill will protect the rights of the welfare of the youth and prevent people from being exploited or even from matters of corruption as we've seen in the past? All right. Um, I think, one, I have been doing a lot of work on tech um, and the rights of people who work in the digital space. Most of the people who work in the digital space, something we call the gig economy or platform work, 
could be online writers. It could be people who work on Uber, people who depend on a platform for them to make a living. Young people are often exploited so much as compared to traditional workers. So what this could mean is probably we could have uh, frameworks that protect or guide how um, these benefits could be given out. Let's say, for example, if you work for a platform like Uber, so Uber could be termed as your employer. Because what happens is Uber says we are a company, we are giving you the platform. We are not necessarily your employer. So what that means is that such platforms could be compelled to make contributions for these people so that in the event that the gig is no, is no longer there, these people have a soft landing um, and thereby reduce a lot of exploitation because most of them don't even have transparent contracts and they are often exploited. Um, another thing is um, the aspect of negotiating power. So having an unemployment insurance can give the youth a negotiating power in seeking employment because they are less likely to accept exploitative working conditions or unfair wages when they have some form of financial support. And what that does is that it reduces their vulnerability to exploitation. Other thing is reducing desperation. People are often exploited because they are very desperate. A lot of young people are desperate for jobs. So unemployment insurance could help reduce desperation of unemployment and uh, could help reduce the desperation of unemployment by providing people with some form of a safety net, uh, making them less susceptible to exploitative job offers because we'll have a standard that says this is how much you can contribute. And obviously they can't contribute so much that they are earning. So it allows people to to be to reduce desperation and in a way even promotes fair labor practices because uh, participating in such an insurance program employers could be likely to adhere to labor practices so those are some of the benefits i think will come and thereby reduce exploitation of young people especially a lot of young people who work on the digital space and do platform work uh, I think there is need to recognize that even digital work is work and it requires the necessary safeguards and protections as um, just like traditional employment, you know, a normal, by traditional, I mean a normal nine to five job where people have, wear suits, ties, mini, they have a contract. So I think it's high time as a country we recognized um, people who do platform work, give them the necessary safeguards so that they are not exploited every other single day, like we've seen happening in the recent past. Yes, 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 that's perfect. I totally agree with what you've said. And I just want to say thank you, Kimani, for breaking down everything for us, especially concerning the bill. I feel like you gave a proper explanation of what it involves, what it is about, what to expect, what not to expect, what how to limit our expectations, and how it could necessarily or eventually help us for that. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for availing yourself. I want to thank you for giving us your time. I've been your host, Amdana Kataka, and definitely Kimani gave us amazing, amazing insights. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time, and thank you for sharing with us your ideas and what you believe in and what you stand for when it comes to this bill. Thank you for having me, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a lovely day.